Okay, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, later this evening, if you really want to know all the details, you can ask me why I left the Higgs boson and moved to the brain, but I will not tell you now. This is a, a view of Obergogel. This is where we are, and you see the HPP sun shining on us, giving us uh, <laughs> enlightenment, okay? Who in this room is actually involved in the Human Brain Project? Okay, so that's the minority, I would say. And so I think it's a good idea that before I actually start <clears throat> talking about cognitive computing, that I spend maybe five minutes introducing the Human Brain Project to you and, and, and what the purpose is. I mean, that was said many times today, and I repeat it once again. It is really bringing neuroscience to computing, and only, not only neuroscience, also uh, medicine, of course, in particular, neuromedicine. And, and of course, the, the connection to computing, in a way, should be pretty obvious. It's that computing, if you just buy it outside in your favorite supermarket, if you buy state-of-the-art computers, they are very useful for neuroscience because they can be used for data analysis and simulation and visualization and many other purposes. But there is this other direction that is that you because the brain is an information processing device or system that you use the knowledge from the brain to build computers that are like the brain. And that from the beginning was one of the purposes of the project and very much under the heading future computing. And uh, so the idea of the project is to build, develop, and use or operate a state of the art ICT, that's a typical European jargon here, information and communication technology, infrastructure. So what is an infrastructure? I will explain that. But the project started uh, about four years ago, 2013. It is now in what we call phase two, and it is ready to offer services to external users through these infrastructures. So what is the infrastructure? The infrastructure is six platforms, as we say, ICT platforms, and they all deal with things that are related to brain science or to medicine. And they are all ICT or computing based. And uh, they are ordered in some way here, which is a bit awkward, but that is the ordering which was once decided at the beginning of the project. And of course, we just stick to that order. Uh, there, is the, there are the two informatics platforms. They are basically data platforms. So the idea is to aggregate data from neuroscience or from medicine and make them available in terms of atlases, brain atlases, and in terms of the medical informatics to classify brain diseases based on brain imaging of which there are many methods. And I'm not going to talk about this today. Then there are the more, how should I say, technological platforms. Uh, there's first the brain simulation platform. That was initially the heart of the project. If you read initial press releases of the Human Brain Project and also press reports, they all said, this project will simulate the human brain. And it was very much Henry Markram behind that. Now, people were not all enthusiastic about that. And in fact, you know probably that the project was very much criticized for this approach. I still think it's a very worthwhile approach, uh, but because of this criticism, this brain simulation is still in the project but I would say it's no longer dominating the project. Still, it's there, and the idea is to build brain models and to run them in closed-loop brain simulations. And I will come back to this kind of closed loop again because I think it's really important. The next one is the uh, classical one, which you would expect, high-performance computing platform. That was the original name uh, since a year or so, and A has been added here, HPUC for analytics, so it's develop high performance computing system that are optimized for brain simulation and data analysis. Then there is neuromorphic computing. This is my own field and the field of many others here in the room. It's to develop brain derived computing systems. Finally, robotics, develop virtual robotic systems. Again, for closed loop, you see the connection here, cognitive experiments. So those are the five, uh, the six platforms. How do they all work together? Well, that's kind of the, the basic idea of the Human Brain Project. I will be very short on this. But, of course, the basis for everything is neuroscience. It's the fact that nature has invented this wonderful system, which is present in animals like the mouse, in humans, 
And of course, there are also sort of more abstract ways of addressing this in cognitive neuroscience, and in particular also in theory. And so there is a neuroscience section in HPP consisting of four subprojects: theory, cognitive neuroscience, human neuroscience, and mouse neuroscience. And those guys here, they do something very important. They provide input for those building the platforms. It's a concept that's called co-design. Yeah? So we learn from theory, for example, how to build good neuromorphic computers. So there are these six platforms. They are being built. They are still under development, although they already work to some extent. And, and one of the big ideas is that access to those platforms should be easy. Yeah? So it's, it's not easy to, to use these kind of systems there. This is a neuromorphic computing system because it's a totally different kind of computer. And it was always the idea that access should be easy for non-expert users. So not only for those who are able to wire up those printed circuit boards, but really for everybody with interest in neuroscience. And so there is this idea of a collaboratory, which is basically a web-based interface that you can use uh, to use uh, the, the platforms. Now, what are we generating? Of course, there is knowledge about the brain. That's the basic science output which will then in turn feed back here and helps to improve the platforms even more. But there is another area which is often not seen so much, but which I personally think is very important. It's, there is also applications in brain technology, which would lead to technological innovation. I have to use this word because the European Commission insists that if they insist quite a bit of money, it's not a billion, by the way, it's a lot less, but if they invest a lot of money, that innovation has to come out, which helps European industry. So this is what users get from the platform, basic science and innovation. Okay, and there is this collaboratory. Many of you are probably already signed up for it. Uh, if, if you are not, you can have different types of access. You can be a public user. You can achieve a HPP identity and then go through all these steps here. At the end, you can be an HPP member. If you're interested, send a mail to platform at Human Brain Project. EU. That was my super short introduction into the Human Brain Project. We'll now come to the talk, and um, this is called, it has a, a grand name, it's called the Era of Cognitive Computing. So what do I mean by that? Um, I've stolen this from IBM, and uh, they talk a lot about cognitive computing. It's really IBM speaking mostly about cognitive computing. And there is the CEO, president, and chairwoman, of IBM, Jenny Romiti, and, and she made this statement here, which is a typical industry speak, but which is still quite interesting. She said, today we stand poised on the brink, I mean, these are great words, of a new era of computing in which technology is more, and now there are the interesting words, consumable, insight-driven, and cognitive. IBM research is exploring and developing the enabling technologies that will transform the way computers are used. And IBM claims that as a function of time, oops, and there are no years here, but you can guess what they are. This is time, and this is kind of uh, the computational computer intelligence. That is how she calls it. And she says, well, this is the IBM view. Uh, computing started with tabulating machines, where you s type data into punched cards, and then sort them by some parameter, print them out, and then do all kind of data analysis in a very moderate way. This is sort of the 14s, the 1940s typically, even before. This is the tabulating systems area. And then of course, this is what you all know, you have all, you know, grew up in that area, it's the programmable systems era, it started around the 60s and of course is still going on and will actually go on. And now IBM claims there is this cognitive systems era which will apparently, whatever that is, add more computer intelligence to our world. Now, uh, cognitive is the key word, and uh, of course we have to understand what it means. You all learned Latin at school, I suppose, and there is this word cognoscere or cognoscere, depending on how you learned it. I had to say cognoscere when I learned it, but it doesn't really matter. It means get to know, okay? So it's about acquiring knowledge. This is what these computers are supposed to do, to acquire knowledge and to make it available. Now, of course, we have to be a bit more, a bit more uh, explicit on that. And I looked through a lot of literature, and, and I mean, the definition of cognition and cognitive computing are, are very strange, and often I didn't like them at all. The best thing I found is 
is actually a company that has been founded by, by a computational neuroscientist in Cambridge. It's called Cambridge Cognition. And they have this definition, which I like a lot, and I will refer to this throughout my talk. It says, what is cognition? Cognition is a mental action. So it's really, these are humans, or these are biological systems. Of course, not computers at this time. A mental action or process of acquiring knowledge. This is what we just said, get to know. Acquiring knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding through, and that's important now, thought, experience, and the senses, okay? Uh, so there is thought, of course, there has to be a, a process of crunching the data that come in. There is experience, and that's very important. It means you cannot just send data into a system in the hopes that it does something useful, but you have to go through a process of gaining experience. And this is what we call learning, and that's a very, very important thing. I mean, all cognitive systems that we want to build in the future have to, this have to be able to collect experience through a learning process. And of course, there has to be inputs. That's very important. And these, those are the senses. Those could be biological senses like olfaction and auditory and vision or whatever, but it could also be more abstract things if you just look to abstract data. Then it says, it goes on and says, critical for day-to-day -day life. We know that governing our thoughts and actions, we need cognition to help us understand information about the world around us and interact safely as the sensory information we receive, and that's again very important now, is vast and complicated. You know, I mean, that's the important thing. We can, we can process information which is very, very vast. There's a lot of information entering my eyes now in this room in which I have never been before. Actually, I've been here two years ago, but I would be able to give this talk in any conference room of this world. And it, it, it always looks slightly different, but you kind of always ma manage to do this. So you have this vast and complicated information, and you do something very important. Cognition is needed, and this is another important word, to distill all this information down to its essentials, okay? For example, if you go walking on, on Wednesday, and you come to a very dangerous part of a mountain, at the end, you want to distill it just to one bit of information. Do I move forward or not? All right, because if I move forward, I will fall down and die. So there is a lot of information coming in, and cognition, based on experience and our senses and thoughts, helps us to distill the information to something very, very basic. There's this huge amount of information. At the end, it's a simple thought, a simple thing that you produce. And that's the task of cognitive computing. We do that with our brain. You all know what it looks like, at least from the outside here. It's an amazing system. It has 10 to the 11 neural cells, which are called nodes here, or neurons. There are 10 to the 15 connections, synapses, which interconnect, and we'll discuss this later a little bit. It's important that the, the picture here, although it looks kind of nice, it's unrealistic because this looks like a closed system, but it's not. It's an open system. I put this in red here because that's important. And it's driven by external inputs and output. It can only work if it interacts with the world. There are timescales involved here, and we will discuss this later. And there are timescales from milliseconds to years, which, as you will see later, is more than 10 orders of magnitude. And that's extremely important. Another important thing is that there is dynamics. This is not static, but there are long and short-range so, uh, short interactions, and they change all the time. They are dynamic. Another interesting thing is that the brain is not understood in all detail. And that's a very, very important point of criticism to the Human Brain Project. How can you possibly hope to develop cognitive computers, supercomputers, or neuromorphic computers, if you didn't even understand the system that you want to mimic? Yeah, there are major non-understood contributions to the dynamics. We haven't understood learning to all detail. There are cells, many more neurons than, than uh, uh, there are glial cells of which there are more than neurons, and we don't really know what their role are. So people say, well, you should probably first understand the brain and then do all these simulation and neuromorphic computing things. That was the major criticism in this open letter. It's too early to do that. Stop doing it. And I think that's a mistake. You can work on a system that you didn't understand. Okay? And ICT methods like simulation, like neuromorphic computing, hopefully will help us to understand the brain. If we just wait until we understood it, we will never, ever start doing things like that we do today.
Okay, so it's very important that you can work on a system that you didn't understand, and computing will help you to improve understanding. Let's have a short look to the visual system. That's an example, of course, of, of sort of a cognitive system. It creates a meaningful representation of our world, an optical representation, 3D world. It recognizes objects, detects motion, color, and edges, reconstructs 3D depth, creates representation of a world useful for action. Of course, we want to do the feedback to our world. It stores visual memories. And to understand all these different functions is essential, and we have to understand how they are organized. And I will not discuss the visual system today. I will just point you to one thing, uh, which is very important, that often if we discuss the visual system, we do it like this. This is a, a paper from Sakolan from CISA in Switzerland. So you have a sensor, a pattern of light, which is recorded by a sensor. There are photoreceptors. There are the retinal ganglion cells. This is all happening in the eye. Then there is the lateral uh, genicular nucleus, which receives the input signal from the eye. And then there is what, what is really a, a, a hierarchical system, which produces information from the initial image, which is, starts from a very low level and starts to be at a higher and higher level until you really recognize an object. So this is a typical hierarchical system, very much like the deep networks, the feed-forward networks, that people now implement in artificial neural networks. And in a way, this is an example of what I call a stimulus response type description of the system. There's a stimulus, it's a pattern of light, and the response is some kind of inference, for example. So that's a, 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 a stimulus response system. Now, let's, if I jump straight into cognitive computing, for probably one of the most known systems for co cognitive computing, not surprisingly, comes from IBM. I'm making a lot of propaganda for IBM here. It's called Watson. You heard about Watson. It's kind of a system that answers questions like, what is the capital of Austria, for example? I mean, that's a very simple question. But this system could easily answer it. And they have this, this system here, which I'm not going to discuss in detail. But it's in the same way, as I described before, it's a stimulus response system. Okay, There is a question which is processed somehow, it's decomposed, and then, then you have certain databases which are either externally or internally with sources of answers, sources of evidences. You synthesize all the input, and at the end, you give an answer. And this system was able to win this, what is it called, Jeopardy game, which is a TV show in the US, where you just answer these kind of questions like the one I just, I just mentioned. So it's a stimulus response system. And, and many people today think or consider Cognitive computing are good stimulus response system. And of course, it's relatively simple if you look to this system or this system to implement this on a conventional computer. You just write code. You write code that describes all these elements here in the same way that you write code that describes all those elements here. And then you put in a stimulus and you see whether the response makes sense. Okay, now of course, I mean, this is also done in the biological world. There are very simple animals like amoebae, for example, and they are also stimulus response systems. Now there's this little joke here, which is very nice. There's stimulus response, stimulus response, don't you ever think, okay? And in fact, what these peep systems that I just showed, a very simple description of the visual system and also the Watson systems, they don't think. So what do I mean by think? There's actually, I mean, this is one example of a system that is maybe a better system high-level description of how cognitive computing could work. This is kind of, I call it a feedback cognitive architecture, including an internal model and learning. This is by this guy, Jesse Rosenblatt here from Arizona. It's just one example, but I like it a lot because it has all the elements that you really want to have in a truly cognitive system. First of all, it interacts with the real world. The real world, of course, we think is a room like this one here, but it could also be abstract data. But the important thing that there is a perceptor that actually extracts information from the world, and there is an effector that changes the world. You can actually have an effect on the world. So that's very important, and that's the closed loop approach. Huh? And now the really cool thing is that this model has what's called a model of the world. This is the real world, and there is a model of the world. And they are probably not exactly the same. 
it's just a model which is useful to close this loop. And we think that we all in our brain have this kind of internal model. We have a model of the world. It's probably difficult and uh, different in all our brains, but we build this model. And then we make something very interesting. So we have a perception here, and then we do something which is also very important. We do some kind of a simulation, okay? If I have this object in my hand and I let it fall, I make in my brain, I do a simulation on what will happen, okay? And I make the simulation based on the perception I get from the outside world and based on my knowledge that I have stored in my brain through the learning process. So I use this, the, the world state and the perception to make a simulation. And that simulation can produce expectations. So I can produce expectations. That's very important. I can make predictions. And making predictions is a very, very important feature of, uh, of cognitive systems. Then, of course, in order to produce an effect on the world, I need a planner, which again uses, of course, the result of the simulation. It uses the model base, the internal model of the world, and, of course, it uses this world state. Okay? And then I have an executor, which then closes the loop. So there are some features here which are very important. I need an internal model of the world. I, I need some kind of a simulator that really makes a prediction of what I'm, happy, what I'm going to do. I need a planner, and I need a closed loop operation. These are really essential elements for uh, cognitive computing systems. And the co cognitive computing systems that we have now do not really have these features. And I think we have to work on it very hard to make this in reality, a reality. Now, how do you do that? Of course, the classical way is you write, draw a block diagram like this one here, and then you, you put even maybe smaller elements in here, and you say, well, let's write a program. Let's make a, a perceptor program and a monitor program, a database, a diagnoser, an executor program, and then we run this program on a very high level, and it will do useful things. And I don't think this is the right way to do and uh, there's another quote which I would like to bring forward here. This is Francis Crick, one of the discoverer of the double helix, the DNA. And he works, he's, oh, he, he doesn't live anymore, but Christoph Koch, uh, he's still very active in the field. And, and both together, they made the statement which I find very important. In biology, if seeking to understand function, and when we, what we looked at here is function. This is function, okay? If you want to understand, it's usually a good idea to study structure. Okay, so we should understand what the structure is of biological system. And of course, we know what structure is of biological systems. I mean, it's all started at the end of the 19th century with the famous measurements or observations, microscopic observations of Ramani Kachal, uh, who made these microscopic images here, and he found the nerve cells and the nerve fibers, the axons and the dendrites, and he saw that the brain is actually not a homo homogeneous mass, but it's really made of elements, which are the neural cells. Those are the cell bodies here. And through these fibers, it's obvious that there is some kind of interaction over a distance. And you can imagine that through these trees here, that there is integration, certainly spatial integration in a network, but also temporal integration. How can we say that? Well, about at the same time in the lab of Hermann von Helmholtz, actually in Heidelberg, there was one of his assistants Julius Bernstein, who started to work on the fact that these are not just static images, but there are electrical currents flowing. And Julius Bernstein discovered that these cells communicate through action potentials, not through constant currents, but really through these pulses here, spikes or action potentials. Although that was the basis. And since then, we have learned a lot about structure of the brain or uh, uh, the, the microscopic structure. And of course, the question is, if you now start to construct networks, what are the atoms of the brain? What are the elements that you have to bring together uh, to build a system that can do cognitive computing? And what are the interactions between these atoms? Of course, atoms in quotation marks here. Now, there are several ideas. You say, so, well, those are the molecules. Of course, you can do even further. You can go to atoms and things like that and nuclei, but that's probably not relevant. Molecules are certainly relevant, but then, of course, there are larger units. There are synapses, there are neurons and glial cells, there are networks and there are entire brain areas. And this is really a, 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 a large coverage in scales, in spatial scales. Molecules start at the nanometer or sub-nanometer level uh, to brain areas, which are sort of a fraction of a meter, maybe centimeters or something like that. And so you see immediately, 
If you look to structure, we can look at microscopic structure, mesoscopic and macroscopic structure, covering seven orders of magnitude. And the question is, where do we start building cognitive computers? And our current, our current ideas is that there is something which we call the neuron doctrine. We, in most of the work we do for simulations and also for neuromorphic computers, we say we don't look to molecules. I mean, that's not so much that we don't want to look at them. It would just be too much effort. I mean, to do simulations on the molecular level of a whole brain is probably out of reach for quite a while, if not forever. So the neurons are tractable. I think that's really the reason. It's a very practical reason. Also, as you have seen on the Cajal picture, they are very visible. So it's kind of obvious that they must have a function in information processing. Now, this is a purely spatial view. In reality, of course, there's not only space, but there's also time. And that's extremely important now. Okay, so here you see the same scale. Synapses, dendrites, neurons, layers, nuclear, the whole brain. This again is several orders of magnitude, like seven, as I said on my previous slide. So this is space. And this is time here, okay? And I say milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, maybe years. And if you count, this is something like 11 orders of magnitude. So this is space versus time. What's the colorful stuff in between? Well, that is actually the method that neuroscience has developed to experimentally study these areas. For example, if you want to measure on the millisecond level, on the level of individual neurons or subneuronal structures like dendrites, the patch clamp methods is probably the, 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 the thing of, of, uh, that you would choose. If you want to look at the dendritics and synaptic level, very high spatial resolution, but you cannot really, or you wish you would like to go here, but you can't really. What you instead can do is you can do electron microscopy, which is, of course, a destructive method. But then, of course, you would have to kill the brain, analyze it, which takes at least minutes or hours, okay? And so you see the whole area here is filled. This is a thing done by Terry Senyovsky, who got lost here, unfortunately. And this is the progress of neuroscience from 1988 to 2014. So the idea is that there's a lot of data from neuroscience. And um, of course, we know even more. We know uh, what I just said in the, uh, from the initial uh, studies of, of Bernstein, uh, that there is temporal and spatial uh, charge integration in the neurons. And the communication between the neurons is binary, continuous time across dynamic links. Dynamic means they can change according to some learning rules. And this is across the synapses. And there is the stereotypic action potential, the spike. That's actually the unit of communication between neural cells. A another little thing on neuronal communication uh, showing the uh, integration, actually, of the signal. So there is a receiving neuron here, and there are synapses in between. So this is a postsynaptic neuron. These are presynaptic neurons. And what happens is if you, if you let this presynaptic neuron spike here, there's a spike traveling to the synapse. The synapse converts it into a postsynaptic potential, uh, which is then integrated by the neuron membrane. And you see these kind of, of pulse here, which has a, ri a rise time and a fall time. So there is no real integration taking place here. It's more interesting if you have two connecting uh, presynaptic neurons here, which both fire. Then you, get, you see that on the membrane, there is some kind of buildup. Of course, it's dampened by the decay time of the neuron, but it, it's kind of, there is a continuous signal now. Now we do two things at the same time. There's no integration here. There's spatial integration there. There's temporal and spatial integration. So we have these three spikes arriving here, and that pushes us close to something which we may call a threshold, and then the neuron fires. So this is typically what happens if neurons communicate. Now, uh, if you look to uh, a neuronal network on a larger scale, this is not a microscope picture, but it's a reconstructed network done by Henry Markram's group, group of the Blue Brain Project. This is part of a cortical column of a, of, of a red cortex. You see many neural cells. You see their connections. You see some kind of layer structure. But what you can say, this is rather uniform. There is obviously no obvious separation of memory and computing, which you expect from a classical computer. Obviously, this thing is not being programmed. And probably worst of all, 
there's no established theory to describe this kind of network. Now let's go to computers. At some point we want to go to computers. This is again IBM, I'm sorry. Uh, this is actually an ancient microprocessor. It's a G5 microprocessor shown at about the same length scale. And you see there's a big difference here. Uh, the first thing you see is that this microprocessor is kind of very modular. It looks like a city with certain buildings and streets. And that's basically what it is. So you see all these blocks here, which are memories and uh, routers and, uh, and uh, uh, compute units, ALUs, and things like that. So it's a very modular system. It is obviously very engineering friendly. If you want to build a system like that, that would be possible with a bunch of like, 200 engineers or something like that. Here, it will be very difficult, obviously. The other good thing is that it's easily mapped to programming models. You can probably all program these kind of things. This network is not even being programmed. You know? So this is easy to use. Here we have to think a lot. And the good thing is that classical computers are theoretically sound. I mean, it's basically all Boolean algebra with some additions, and we have understood that very well. Now, uh, traditional computing, uh, that's what you see here, is fast, precise, and reliable, and it performs numerical computation. It is, on the downside, very energy intensive. It has very high reliability requirements. If one of these blocks fails here, normally the whole chip goes down, and it requires pretty fine algorithms and software. On the other hand, the brain does pattern detection, we just said that, and uh, prediction, and it's making that from noisy data. It's very energy efficient, fault tolerant, and it can perform learning, which is, of course, always matched the good points here to the bad points here. Energy efficient, energy intensive, fault tolerant, high reliability requirements, learning, and algorithms and software. Uh, maybe a bit more, how far now? We still have a little bit of time. Uh, this is a more computational view of a comparison between contemporary IT systems and neural computation. Contemporary IT system, processor memory-based architectures, von Neumann is the name, serial command execution, basically Turing machines, predetermined algorithms define capabilities and performance, that's the software aspect, reproducible states and reversible time evolution, electronics implementation of Boolean operators, very high power consumption, high yield requirements, little fault tolerance, and it's limited. What limits computational, com conventional computers? Atomic distance scale in the components, the nanometer. So it's ultimately component limited because we will reach the size of individual atoms. I will come to that. The good thing is well understood. Eurocomputation, on the contrary, is maximally parallel, nonlinear computing uh, elements uh, with very large diversity. I will discuss this. Time correlations are very important. Learning is very important, low power consumption. And what limits the performance of these systems? Well, it's not the components, but it's more the network. It's the degree of complexity. So this is architecture or size limited. Probably a bigger brain, to some extent, would be better than a smaller brain. The bad thing is that it's not understood, and it's definitely one of the major challenges. Uh, I don't have to introduce von Neumann machines to you, but what we do with these von Neumann machines, of course, we use them to give PowerPoint presentations, but we also use them for simulations and also for brain simulations. And brain simulations are one approach to now do what I just said. So we have a high level description of, say, the visual system or whatever part of the brain. And I said we have to go down and look to the structure and run simulations that are based on individual neurons. And this is a, a study done by Markus Diesmann from uh, Jülich, also part of HPP. This is an older publication here. And he put a very large network, like 10 to the 9 neurons, really a huge neural network, all little spiking neurons, on a supercomputer with 64, 256, 65,000 processors. So what he does is he uses more and more processors, and he makes the network larger. Because you say, this is a perfect case for what the computer scientists call weak scaling. OK? So you have a fixed problem size, and you just put it to more and more processors, and you make your network bigger and bigger, and your compute time stays constant. All right? That's the idea. Now what you see, this is the compute time here. And you see it kind of works. Okay, This is rising here, and the compute time stays constant. Not really. 
Now, Keith, you see there is a little deviation here. And of course, it gets worse if you know that this is a log scale. So there is actually quite some deviation from weak scaling. But nevertheless, it kind of works. But there are some problems here. I mean, one problem, of course, is that uh, the runtime for a second of biology is about, well, more than 10 to the 3 seconds if you go to the large networks. That means these simulations run a factor of 1,000 slower than biology, which you may say, well, it doesn't really matter. Then I run a little bit longer. But if you think about learning, and we'll discuss learning later, this is probably a big problem. The other thing is that this runs on a machine with 12 megawatts. Now, what does this really mean? It's difficult to interpret that. But if you power, I mean, megawatt is power. But rather than talking about power, we should probably talk about energy, and energy for some fundamental computation. And the com fundamental computation, this should be readable here, it's a transmission, a synaptic transmission. Okay? And the energy spent on the synaptic transmission in our own brain is about 10 to the minus 14 joule, or 10 femtojoule. And I will come, come to that. Now, if you, run, if you look at Markus Diesmann's simulation with this NEST code, it's about 0.1 millijoule. So there are 10 orders of magnitude between here. Yeah? So the biological system, if you simulate it on a spiking neural level, level, is 10 to the 10 times more efficient than the NEST simulation. Now, those are very simple neurons and synapses. If you go to a more fancy biophysically correct model, like the Markram group at the Blue Brain Project does, they actually spend one joule for a synaptic transmission. So that's 14 orders of magnitude. And the question is, where does this big gap come from? And uh, the question is, we one can discuss a little bit, what is actually the, uh, the, uh, the cost for a neural computation? And there are two ways to calculate this. One is from top to bottom, where you take the total power of the brain, you assume some, which is 20 watts roughly, you assume some firing rates, and you end up with 10 to the minus 10 joule for an action potential, and 10 to the 14 joule for a synaptic transmission. This is what I just discussed. Then you can go from bottom to top. You can ask yourself the question, well, where does, actually, where does the energy come from for the brain? It comes from the fact that we eat and drink, and uh, those are ATP molecules which we can hydrolyze. That produces the energy, and the energy we get from one molecule is approximately one electron volt, which is not surprising. This is a molecular process. And we need about a billion ATP molecules for an action potential and 100,000 for a synaptic transmission. If you do the multiplications, you end up with the same number, 10 to the minus 10 for an action potential, 10 to the minus 14 for a joule, uh, 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 for a synaptic transmission. Now you can say, well, that's understood, but it's clear why computers are so much more energy expensive, because they are made of silicon. And silicon is intrinsically inefficient, uh, and biology is soft and wet and efficient. Okay? And it's interesting that that is not the case. That's absolutely not the case. This is a capacitor. And transistors are basically capacitors. You charge them up, and then they control a current flowing through. This is a, a, a capacitor made of mass metal and semiconductor. There's an insulator in between. This is what is called MOS. This is a MOS transistor. And you can calculate the charge. This is an old-fashioned transistor, large, 200 nanometer, 5 volts, high voltage. And the energies, you learn that in your basic physics class, 1 half capacitance voltage squared. And so the switching of a transistor, you pay 1 femtojoule if you put in the numbers. Okay? And it's much less today. And we remember a synaptic transmission is 10 femtojoule. Okay? That means a, a, a synaptic transmission in biology is about switching of 10 low-tech CMOS transistors. So if you could find a way to make synapses from transistors, you could spend uh, 10 transistors, and today even more, probably more like 100 transistors, to build that circuit. And the system would be as efficient as the biological brain. So it's not the devices. There's nothing wrong with transistors. They are great. They are as efficient or energy efficient as biological cells. It's not the devices. It's a very important message. It's the architecture and the computational model. It's the von Neumann architecture which forces us to transmit data between memory and compute unit all the time. And, and th that's the energy argument. The other thing which you saw in Markus Diesmann's simulation is now time scales. And I think that's even more important. Okay? You, you see, in, the, in nature, in the brain, we saw there are many time scales. 
There's synaptic, typically synaptic timescales, synaptic causality detection. I cannot discuss this here. It's about on the millisecond level, sub-millisecond level, 100 microseconds. Synaptic plasticity on the second level, learning takes days, development years. If you put in evolution, it's millennia. 12 orders of magnitude, 15 orders of magnitude. In a simulation, you can easily, easily address uh, synaptic plasticity and maybe learning to some extent. But the slow processes like development are totally inaccessible to computers because it would take years, thousands of years. And during those thousands of years, you have to burn a megawatt over megawatt. So there is no way you can do large-scale computer simulations of the brain, including the slow learning and development processes. Again, to convince you that this is important, these are many images of the human brain. Uh, these are MRI studies. And what, what people plot here, this is a paper by Koktai, here's the reference, is the fraction of gray matter in the brain. And uh, pink means very little, and red and yellow means a lot. And this is a young person of five years, and this is an older person of 20 years, which is kind of the most important part of your life, okay? between 5 and 20, because that's the time where you build this internal model of the world. If you don't learn during that time, you are lost for the rest of your life. So this is really an important time. And what happens during this time is your gray matter disappears as a fraction of the brain material. And is that aging? No, it's the opposite. It means that the gray matter is replaced in fraction by white matter, which is, which is the connectivity, uh, the dendrites and the synapses and the, the axons, and so the connectivity, the wiring of the brain actually takes 15 years. So this is a very slow process and constant interaction with the world, of course. If you want to simulate that, maybe you don't have to simulate 15 years, but you probably have to simulate at least a couple of months or so, and that's not possible on a supercomputer. This has been recognized early on in the Human Brain Project. This is a, a very early plot where I plot uh, uh, talk about temporal scales, this is the computational requirement to simulate the human brain, okay? That was kind of a very early plot of HPP. And, and the, the statement was, we will need an exascale machine, okay? Which probably at some point will be built. At this point, we are more like here. And, and, and then if you have an exascale machine, and if you have also the memory, which is more harder to implement, of course, about 100 petabyte, to actually store the model of the brain, which you then run, then you can do a brain simulation on the cellular level. So this, this looks great. But of course, that's not the full truth. Because this model on the cellular level would probably run a factor more like 5,000 slower. So you can typically simulate hundreds of milliseconds, which does not include learning processes, which are so important for cognitive computing. And also, that was recognized very early. If you want plasticity, learning, development, you need an increase in computational complexity by at least a factor 10 for development. I just discussed this, probably a factor 1,000, which con conventional computer computers will not deliver you. There are other interesting aspects of the brain very rapidly. It's the robustness, of course, after the age of 20. You all know that now. The opposite happens, OK? Your brain decays. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the adjusted volume in cubic centimeter of the lateral prefrontal cortex, where a lot of cognitive tasks are being carried out of men and women. I don't tell you who are the men and who are the women here. They look the same in any case, and it's not very good data. But you see that with age, you actually lose a large fraction of your brain. You just lose typically a brain cell per second. And so still, this is normal aging. There is no brain diseases at work here. So the brain is a very, very, comp a very, very robust device. Yeah? So you can lose cells and still have an operational system. Try to lose one per transistor per second in your microprocessor. It will fail very, very fast. Okay? Uh, the other thing is, uh, is uh, variability. Very shortly, one of my favorite topics. This is a lobster. And it has no brain, but probably has a brain, but it has a, a set of nervous cells which control the move of food through this animal. And there's a simulation done by Eve Marder, and she has shown that she, that she can simulate the, uh, the uh, uh, sort of the process of moving the food through the uh, stromatogastric system of the lobster by varying parameters of neural cells. These are, I think, like 21 parameters, conductances, 
uh, and, and reversal potentials. And this is sort of the collective behavior of the network. And you see that these parameters, the blobs tell you how much you can vary the parameter by still getting the same performance. So unlike transistors and microprocessors that all have to be the same, in biological system there can be variability. Of course, it has to be at the right place. All these things I just described would be great to have in cognitive, artificial cognitive systems. This is Horst Simon. Uh, he is the deputy director of uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, in particular expert for supercomputing. He made this great statement. He says, high performance computing will evolve towards a hybrid model, integrating emerging non-Van Neumann architectures with huge, huge potential in pattern recognition, streaming data analysis, and unpredictable new applications. Uh, so he says, well, what we should do is to really combine the two computing approaches. And the question is, how do we do that? There are, uh, there's an important question, is how much biology do you need in order to do these things? And, uh, and uh, of course, you have to ask, ask yourself the question, what is it that you want to do? Do we want to build artificial brains? Certainly not. And the reason is that a lot of features are, not, are, are missing. We don't know how learning really works. We don't know what glial cells are good for. But the observation is that even if you have a dramatically incomplete picture of the brain, you already can do some interesting computation. And of course, sort of the first thing that people did was artificial neural networks, which is a very, very simple thing in principle. You have a layered structure of cells, which looks a bit like the brain, you have connections between them, and these connections have strength. And you copy from biology the integration, the fact that there's a cell that integrates and has an output. And, 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 and here, this solves the XOR problem, actually, which is a hard problem that cannot be solved by linear separation, but it can be solved by this very little network. And it has a very, it plays a trick, because in the XOR, you should have no output if both inputs are on, which is very hard to achieve. And you achieve this here by having this little minus sign, okay? The weight of this neuron here is minus two, and it suppresses the signal if both of these are on, okay? And this is a thing copied from biology. It's called inhibition. So neurons cannot only excite, but only inhibit. And just by copying all these little things from biology, you would say this is not a brain, but already it does useful computation. And the big question is, an unsolved question, is what does this plot look like? It's the degree of simplification and the computational power. So if we simplify, if we make simpler and simpler, does the computational power drop like a stone, or does it stay constant for a while and then drop if we simplify too much? And to find out what this plot looks in reality is one of the goals of the Human Brain Project. Very shortly, you know what artificial neural networks are. Basically, is what I just described. This is a very simple neural network. It uh, has only local connections, it has no recurrency, it's a feed-forward network, but what you have is an input pattern here, sort of a pixelated images of cats and other objects, and then these neurons here integrate the input, and at the output layer you have uh, a label, for example, going on and saying that there's a cat on the input. What a neuron does uh, in this very simple uh, artificial neural network model is that a neuron just sums over all the input, and there are weight factors, so what you have to do is a multiplication and an addition, and then there is a, transition, a transfer function which produces the output. Uh, and of course, what you have to do in order to get this network to work is you have to go through a learning process, and there are various learning processes. There is supervised learning where you have labeled input data, and you have the actual output that your network produces, and you know there is also a desired output, and normally, the actual output and the desired output do not agree. So you calculate an error signal, which by some means you use to correct your learning system. And then you start the same process again. This is an example for supervised learning. There's also reinforcement learning, where you have a learning machine, which is in a closed loop. It receives rewards from the data or the environment, and it can act on the data or the environment. And also, the data or environment can influence the state of the machine. Okay, so this is a closed loop operation, and it's called reinforcement learning, re oops, reinforced by either rewards or penalties. And you all know what the biggest success of this approach, or one of the biggest successes was, the fact that um, 
uh, this guy actually bet this guy. He is a human Go player, and this one is just uh, representing a machine here. It was the, uh, uh, the, the AlphaGo computer system. Uh, and it's interesting that, that how this has been done. So these people went through a very, very elaborate learning processes running on graphic cards. This is the machine that's uh, being installed at Google here. And they go through a three-step procedure, starting with supervised learning, then having reinforcement learning, where the machine plays against itself. These are self-matches. And then the combination of both. And I will just point you to one number here, uh, the reinforcement learning. Actually, the machine did 128 million matches against itself. Uh, of course, this is a very fast computer. But it takes a while until you can do that. Okay? So it took about a year to do this with 0.5 megawatts of power with this kind of energy. So what you do, you have to do excessive training you know, to train these machines, which is not how humans learn Go. We don't play 120 million matches. Okay? So there's something wrong here. Clearly, this is not how biology works. Still, of course, it's hugely uh, successful. And learning is slow and very expensive. The application can be fast. If I say can be fast, it's quite interesting that uh, if you analyze uh, what you do, you first train, and then you apply the result of the training. And the application, which is actually playing goal, is computationally different from training. Why is that? For the training, you typically need a very good precision. For example, to run a backpropagation algorithm, you typically need uh, certainly more than 8-bit precision. For the application later, you can have relatively low precision 8-bit uh, machines, which all they have to do is to do multiply and add in order to execute this neural network. And I'm showing you this to introduce the next field. I, I, I don't have much time left, but uh, the next part I'm going to talk about, this is a card, a chip, that has been made by Google. And it's a very interesting development that even Google and other major computer makers now recognize that it is worthwhile to make special chips for machine learning applications. This wasn't the case five years ago, and everybody said it's not worth it because the standard generic machine will always do the job. So we are in a phase where we actually build special machines. Now, of course, this is all driven by the development of electronics. This is an example for one logic case. This is so-called D flip-flop, a little memory. And this is sort of a real side. It was actually shown by Holger Eisenreich two years ago at this meeting in this room. And I found it really nice. It shows you the size of a D flip-flop and correct relative size in a 180 nanometer technology, in a 65 nanometer technology, in a 28 nanometer technology, and in a 7 nanometer technology. And it has no end of the road yet which is not quite true. Um, and uh, what we see the, now is that uh, Moore's law, as you see it here, where you see the performance measured in some parameters, like, for example, transistors on a chip here, as a function of the here, Moore's law, of course, says that this is doubling over a certain period, like a bit less than two years or so. And uh, what we start to see now is that although the transistor still, the number of transistors is increasing, pretty much according to Moore's law. There are other parameters, like the single th thread performance, the frequency, the typical power is already flattening out. And the expectation is that over the next years, and that has to happen because transistors approach the size of molecules, for example, or at least a major part of a crystal lattice, that Moore's law is actually coming to an end. And there is an interesting observation is what people do instead of cramming more transistors on a chip and making single processors more powerful, there is the concept of many cores coming up. Starting in 2005, more and more cores are being put on a chip. But if the numbers of transistors flatten out at some point, also this has to become flatter. Now, there's another interesting plot that I want to show you, is that we are actually, with our current computers, we are going away from the brain. What do I mean from, mean from that? That is the clock frequency, starting at a hertz or less to gigahertz here. And this is the power density. What do I mean by that? That's what? That's the power. And now normalized to an area. Okay? And here you see modern processors. And what we do, we walk up this line more and more in this direction. Although here 
Moore's law actually will limit us in terms of clock frequency and of course also in terms of power density. Already now we have about 100 watt per square centimeter. So conventional computers actually went this way. The brain is somewhere down here, many orders of magnitude down, and the question is can we actually go more in this direction, going away from the development of classical processors, going to more brain-like architectures. And that's neuromorphic computing. Um, neuromorphic computing now means that you start to transfer aspects of structural function from biological substrate to electronic circuits. And by structure, I mean the cells, the networks, and the connections, and by functions, the local processing and the cell, the communication, and most importantly, the learning. Why would we do neuromorphic computing? Well, there are exactly two reasons, and those two reasons are also present in the Human Brain Project. One is to understand better biological information processing. That is to help neuroscience to understand the things that we haven't understood really, in particular learning, and uh, the time argument, of course, is very important here. And the other is future computing, cognitive computing, based on biological information processing. Whatever you do, you need a model system to test your ideas. And I think it's fair to say there are two fundamentally different approaches to modeling. One is what is the implementation of a Turing machine, and the other one is a non-Turing machine. What do I mean by that? A Turing machine, as we implemented today, is working as a numerical model. The model parameters are represented by other things. What do I mean by model parameters? Well, for example, voltages, charge, and currents. Voltages, charge, and currents are represented not by voltages, charge, and currents, but by binary numbers. So they are coded. Okay? This is what we do on our computers today. There is another approach, which is also followed up in the Human Brain Project, where we say the model parameters are not represented by binary numbers. They are not coded but they are represented by the same parameters as in the biological system. So voltage is represented by voltage, current by current, and charge by charge. So it's a physical model of the brain which doesn't compute. The only difference is that in the biological brain, currents are flowing through a cell membrane, and in the physical models, currents are flowing through a silicon substrate. But otherwise, it's the same physics. So there is the numerical model and the physical model. Of course, those can be combined to build hybrid systems. So there is a dis discussion of analog and digital, which I have no time to go into here. Uh, we are a little bit in the situation of these two guys here, I hope at least. Uh, this was 1952, John van Neumann, the famous John van Neumann and Robert Oppenheimer, who was the head of the Institute for Advanced Study in those years. And those people actually built one of the first programmable digital computer. It was not the first. The first was in Manchester. We know that very well. It was the Manchester baby. This was a, a year later, but it's such a nice photo that I show, show it here. And the interesting thing is that these people used state-of-the-art devices that were available during those days. And those were vacuum tubes, cathode ray tubes, mercury delay lines, and other things. You don't even know what this is anymore. They have all been replaced. In fact, the transistor did already exist during this time, but people said, no, let's use the devices that we understand to build this machine. But what they focused on their work is the architecture. They invented the memory processor architecture, which we still have today. They invented universality. They used it for neutron diffusion, atomic bombs, weather prediction. So it's a universal machine that is still maintained. And they found that big computers can do more than small computers. This is also maintained. So what we also do in HPP very much, we focus on the architecture. We really want to build architectures that are brain-like, and we do not care so much about the devices at this moment. In neuromorphic computing in the world, I think it's fair to say that there are three approaches which are complementary. And I think the complementarity is essential. So let me go shortly through. There is the Spinnaker approach which is based on commodity microprocessors, ARM processors, many of them. And so the coding of the neural connection and the neural activity is done by software. It's soft binary code. The next step is to go away from conventional microprocessors and go to a system which is fully custom. So it's not, this is not a von Neumann machine anymore, but it's still fully digital. 
This is the True North project by IBM, and I call this hard binary code. And then going furthest away from conventional computer and maybe closest to the brain is what I call a custom mixed signal approach, which is the brain scales project, also in HPP, which is the physical model I just introduced. Okay? Do all these systems have anything in common? Well, I think they are all massively parallel. They are close to perfect weak scaling. They have asynchronous communication, and they have, I think, a reasonably high degree of configurability. Of course, it will never be as high as a conventional computer, but nevertheless, we are pretty close. There is, of course, a limited flexibility and uh, complexity in the neural models. If you want a totally different neural model, you may have problems implementing this on these machines. So very shortly, and there will, of course, be lectures here introducing this. This is a Spinnaker system. It's a many-core system. The basic idea is that connecting many cheap processors by a spike-optimized network. So they have these chips. You see the system running here. On a single chip, there are 18 ARM cores, integer arithmetic, running relatively slowly. There's a shared system RAM on the die uh, and a, a DRAM stacked on top of the chip. The most important thing is this router here. So there are the 18 cores on the chip. There is this router which provides each chip with six bidirectional links, which are really optimized for spike, spike transmission, six million spikes per second per link. And this system effectively is a real-time simulator. There is the IBM system, the Almaden group. As I said already, this is a fully custom, fully digital design. It really exploits economy of scale. These people said this is digital electronics. It's relatively easy to make transistors smaller. Uh, if it's an established process, it will still work. Amazingly, IBM uses a Samsung technology here, 28 nanometer. It's 1 million hardwired neurons on a chip, 256 million one-bit static synapses. This is relatively simple and far away from neuroscience. Uh, it's 5.4 billion transistors, the biggest chip IBM ever made, and it has no plasticity on the chip. But it's certainly a very impressive approach. The physical model system, I would say, is a drastic approach for strong scaling, where you really make the local compute elements faster. And of course, in addition, you also have weak scaling. The basic idea is that if you look to a patch of a membrane, it is basically an analog circuit where you have a, a battery, a resistor or a conductance, and a capacitor. And everybody can write down this differential equation. It's relatively simple for the circuit. That's just Kirchhoff's law. It is also very simple to solve this differential equation. It's a derivative that is equal to the voltage with a minus sign. That means this system just discharges with an exponential function to a value, to the value of the battery. Now, of course, what you have to do if you want to make this system firing and spike communication, you have to add a nonlinearity, and we do that by a comparator. Now, the interesting thing here is that how does this system know how fast to run? I mean, all the systems we have seen before are driven by a clock that actually determines the simulation speed. Here, the speed is actually not given by a clock, but by the internal physics of the component. That means, in particular, by the choice of the resistance and the capacitance. You know, again, from basic physics, that the discharge, this exponential function here, is a time constant, which is <coughs> just given by the product of the resistor and the capacitance. And since capacitances are small in, in electronics and large in biology, and conductances are uh, small in biology and large in electronics, resistors uh, vice versa, uh, the time constant in electronics are very small, and the time constants in biology are long. So this system, by definition, by construction, runs faster than biology. So we have to introduce nonlinearities here. I have no time to discuss this in detail. What we did, oops, what we did in uh, HPP is to build these two systems, which are actually quite nice. Uh, they came in op operation in March last year, and uh, they are the brain scale system and the Spinnaker system. Uh, this one is located in Manchester, this one in Heidelberg. This is a many core machine, so here you see individual boards. And there are many of those boards. You see the same one sitting in these racks here. In total, this system has 500,000 cores. As I said, it's a real-time simulator. This one is a physical model system. It's based on wafer scale integration. It has a 
factor 10,000 times acceleration with respect to biological real time. Um, interesting is how to operate this system. This is just an example for the brain scale system. Now, this is a, an example of how I started this talk. I said, what you have to do is you have to interact with the environment and you have to go through a learning and configuration process. So this is a typical hybrid system where you see the neuromorphic system here and the conventional computer system here. The conventional computer can run learning algorithms. Uh, it can simulate virtual environments. It can send in and receive data. It can run calibrations and many other things. These are the neuromorphic machines and you run this system in a closed loop where you configure and load the system with data sitting on this computer and then you read the result back and for example you run a learning algorithm. So this is a typical setup that we call hardware in the loop where we have a test configuration on the chip or on the hardware. We read the result, we calculate a new configuration through some kind of algorithm, learning or calibration and we send the configuration back to the chip. A typical recent example is that on this system we did some feed forward, so rate based uh, uh, four layer spiking neural network and it actually solved a typical classification task from uh, machine learning and it's quite interesting you may say well that's nothing special many people did that before that's true but I think nobody did this on a on a non-computer okay this is not a computer that actually runs an algorithm but it's really a physical model of a brain circuit that runs that solves this kind of problem with some reasonable precision. There are next generation chips which are in the making, Spinnaker 2 and BrainScales 2. I just go through the main improvements that you all can expect. These systems today have working prototypes and by 2020 we hope to have operational systems and of course that's something you can count, kind of count on and if you're interested you will then be able to work with those. You can start with the prototype already now but until we have operational systems, it will be like 2020. That's the, the current planning. For the Spinnaker 2, uh, there is an update to an upgrade to a four core processing element. There is 25 giga instructions per second per watt on a single die, which is very, very impressive. There will be floating point operations, which is not the case at the moment, and on chip true random numbers. The Brain Scales 2 system, the physical model system, will have more flexible local learning, so rather than doing the loop through the external computer we will be able to do it on chip. Uh, there is on the fly network recon re reconfiguration to study for example developmental processes. There are now structured neurons going away from the single, single, simple point neurons and there is also this idea of dendritic, dendritic computation. This is my last slide. I'm through. I'm sorry. It took a bit longer. Uh, so what do I think? Cognitive computing. What it means is acquiring knowledge and understanding of data through learning and inference. I mean, that is really what we have to do. This is recognized by computing industry as a key contribution to what's now also outside HPP called future computing. Uh, the cu most current implementations are, are non-neural, like for example the Watson uh, approach, and, uh, but the neuromorphic implementations, which we now start to bring into operation, they carry the potential for energy efficiency, robustness, and hopefully then also continuous learning capabilities, which is the most important thing. Okay, I'm through, and we are ready for questions if you are still awake. Thank you very much.